Hi, this is Ray Moss Older. We are back to Brink of Chaos by Tim LaHaye and Craig Parshall. And uh, I'm going to take it back to the last chapter just a little bit so that you get a touch of it. And uh, this is being recorded on a very historic day. It's Mother's Day, 2023. Madrasa explained, I have been in touch with certain intermediaries. They, in turn, have been in contact with the highest political powers. You see, from this humble little apartment, Allah be praised, our influence has now reached all the way up to the meeting places of world leaders. By using their blind assistance, we will begin to mount a most dramatic campaign of all. The first stage is ready to begin. Would you like to see for yourselves who will be the first targets of our fiery retribution? The eyes of the men on the floor flashed. Anwar al Madrasa turned the screen so they could examine the faces. Two infidel enemies of our most holy jihad have set themselves against us. <laughs> but not for long. On the screen was a photo of a man and of a woman. And under the pictures were names Joshua Jordan, Abigail Jordan. Chapter 21 Haifa, Israel. From his position on the exterior metal safety walkway of Israel's new energy facility, Joshua had a spectacular view of Haifa Bay and the azure waters of the Mediterranean. He could see flames shooting up from Israel's oil and gas platforms off the coast, and the large blades of wind turbines that had been constructed along the shoreline. His guide, Joel Harmon, one of Israel's rising political stars, had connected with Joshua a few days earlier. He had invited Joshua to join him on a turn, uh, rather a tour, of the Haifa Energy reprocessing plant today. It was under tight security, but Harmon, with his credentials, was able to whisk his guest through the double gates, guarded by armed security, down to the grounds of the facility without a problem. Harmon nodded to the display of energy infrastructure that stretched out along the coast. Israel has been blessed with energy resources and the advanced technology to develop them. But what I am about to show you now is the most startling resource of all. No one saw this one coming. Of course, when we were able to turn back that incoming nuke from Iran with your RTS system, and it dropped on the Golan Heights for lack of fuel, we all had this same thought. To retrieve the thing before our enemies got their hands on it, which we did. But then there was a second thought. Get the nuclear material, the uranium and plutonium, out of the warhead. As you know, under Prime Minister Bensky, we've been tied into treaties that prohibit us from developing 
defensive nuclear weapons. So, forget the military uses of the material. So you're using it for nuclear energy. Exactly, Harmon replied. He was pumped now, and Joshua saw it in his face. As the newest member of the Energy Committee for the Knesset, I was all over that one. But this, Harmon said, pointing to the metal door next to them on the four-story entrance to the massive building, this was the crumb de la crumb. He swung open the heavy door, and inside <clears throat> Joshua found himself on a metal catwalk, several stories above the energy processing operation, excuse me. <clears throat> Below, he could see a truck dumping a load of onto a platform, with another right behind in line. Harmon explained, when the invaders came at us two years ago, led by the Russian army, they were all using the hardware developed by Moscow. Very ingenious. Israel's military radar is usually very effective, but the Russians built troop carriers and missile launchers, even tanks not out of metal, but with lignostone. Right, Joshua added, super compressed wood. I've followed the research for years. In fact, I personally saw a handgun made out of it back in Seoul at an uncomfortably close range. <laughs> it's impressive stuff. You bet. Hard as steel, but easy to cloak from radar because the material absorbs the radar pulse rather than reflecting it back like metal does. That gave our enemies a considerable advantage when they placed their troops near our borders. The couple extra hours of anti-radar cloaking gave them a huge head start. Harmon pointed to the truck down below. After the war, when the dust cleared, we discovered we had our hands on massive amounts of lignostone. Tons and tons of it. The bright guys at the Technion Institute and several energy companies got to thinking why not convert all this lignostone to combustible fuel? They walked along the catwalk, watching a load of scrap material being fed onto a conveyor belt that was moving it toward the several grinding stations, and then on to ser the series of low-temperature furnaces. Joshua was already thinking about the remarkable fulfillment of a centuries-old biblical prophecy. The key here was to create a usable material that can fuel Israel's energy needs. So how long do you think all of these lignostone armaments will provide energy for Israel. Joshua last. Well, let me guess. Seven years' worth of burnable energy, precisely. Exactly as predicted in the book of Ezekiel. Chapter 39, <laughs> verses 9 and 10. So as I was saying... We've been burning this material. <clears throat> Excuse me. Got that. 
Pray for me, will you? Chapter 39, verses 9 and 10 of Ezekiel. So, as I was saying, we've been burning this material for the last two years at this new facility and processing it into reusable energy cells. According to the Old Testament, we've got another five years of home heating left for Israel. Josh, you are a Christian, and I am a Jew. We have that between us. But we are joined by something important. We both revere the Bible as the Word of God. Yes, and, and something else. Oh, we both believe in the Messiah and know that he's coming. I know his name to be Yeshua, Jesus the Christ. You, on the other hand, still have to figure out whether your Messiah is coming to this world will be his first time or his second. Harmon chuckled and waved in index finger at Joshua. A discussion to be continued later. They walked down the metal stairs to the third level, where Joel Harmon led them to an elevator to the ground floor. The helicopter is waiting on the helipad, Harmon said as he walked outside. Since you are an NIT grad and a world-class engineer, I figured you'd appreciate a tour of our facility here. Also, you're getting a peek at some good news about Israel's future. Joshua thanked him as they rounded the corner of the massive building. Harmon suddenly became somber. No for the tough part about our future. When you arrive in Jerusalem and meet with Prime Minister Bensky, you will find him surrounded by vipers. Well, that's a pretty harsh assessment. I'm being frank. Bensky's a good man, but he's living under a geopolitical delusion as if he had been bewitched by advisors who have sold him on this crazy plan of the United Nations Secretary General. I already have strong feelings about Colloquin. Sure, I read the quote in the Jerusalem Herald where you called Colloquin an impressive voice full of reason, hope, and peace, but with an agenda straight from hell. And you call me harsh? Joel Harmon capped it off with a snicker. Joshua gave him a befuddled look. Joel, that's why I questioned your decision to have me join you and the members of your Hamona party when you meet with Bensky this afternoon. You know, I, I'm nothing but a lightning rod. So, maybe we need a lightning strike. After a moment, Harmon added, Look, Josh, whether you like it or not, when your RTS system saved Israel from that Iranian nuke attack, the year before last, you became a hero to a lot of Israelis. Joshua shook his head. Not all Israelis. Okay, true. Harmon <clears throat> shot back, grinning. But you've read the Old Testament. I'm wandering in the desert under Moses, arguing squabbling. Since when away Israelis 
ever been able to agree on much of anything. Joshua chuckled. Seriously, Joel, I think you need someone else to plead your position to Bensky, not me. This is when I wish I could substitute my wife, who's a brilliant lawyer with terrific negotiation skills, but well, not me. I've, I've never been a strong person on diplomacy. If I open my mouth, I'll be a bull in a china shop. Harmon halted, lifted his index finger into the air. We need a real hero like you, who loves Israel, who has helped already to defend her. Then after pausing and lowering his hand, he added, and a man who has connections. What kind of connections? Let's be honest. If Tulrud wins your presidential election, Israel will be in serious trouble. Tulrud has abandoned all support for our nation. On the other hand, if Hubright wins, our future looks a lot brighter. When Hubright was in the United States Senate, he consistently backed Israel on security and terrorism issues. And we happen to know, Josh, that you, your wife, and your entire round table group are backing Senator Hubright. And we also know that the Senator admires you. And here I thought I knew something about clandestine surveillance. You Israel, Israel, excuse me, you Israelis always impress me with the accuracy of your covert intelligence. By now the helicopter was in view. As the two men approached it, Joshua still didn't feel any differently about the upcoming meeting with the Prime Minister. He said a silent prayer. God, help me keep my feet on the ground during this meeting and my foot out of my mouth. Office of the Prime Minister of Israel, Jerusalem. The meeting lasted over an hour. Some heated words were exchanged, but Harman and the three other members of the Hamona party kept the rancor to a minimum. Prime Minister Bensky listened throughout but talked very little. He lived that up to his two advisors, Chad Zadok, his chief of staff, and Demi Ilyud, his press secretary. Near the end of the meeting, Zadok looked up from his digital clipboard and said, The Prime Minister appreciates your thoughts on the UN peace proposal. Thanks for dialoguing with us. However, the Prime Minister has another meeting. Joel Harmon leaned forward in his chair, his hands open as if he were going to grab someone by the shoulders. Please, Mr. Prime Minister, can you at least share with us that you are open to our concerns, that you are willing to delay this dangerous deal with Mr. Colliquin and his envoy? Why? Zadok shot back. So you and your fledgling little Hamona party can have more time to muster coalition strength behind your weak position? Harmon said, Shooting a quick glance at Joshua, this treaty with Colliquin 
and the United Nations is bad for Israel. Some truths are self-evident. Now Demi Elude jumped into the fray. Warting from America's Declaration of Independence isn't the right answer for an Israeli problem. Oh, I'm sorry, that's a woman. <laughs> now Demi Elude jumped into the fray. Quoting from America's Declaration of Independence isn't the right answer for an Israeli problem. Then she directed her attention to Joshua, who had been silent. Who well, does Colonel Jordan think differently? Joshua smiled, but didn't bite. Chad Zadok joined in. Yes, why don't you share your thoughts with us, Colonel Jordan? Joshua's smile quickly evaporated. Instead of answering, he looked at Prime Minister Solbinski, who gestured for him to speak. I would rather not, he said, hedging. And I would rather you did, Binsky said in a soft voice. I have heard many things about you, Colonel Jordan, some good and some not so nice. So please speak freely. What do you think about the peace proposal about Secretary General Colliquin? I tremble. Chad Zadok latched on at that. You what? I said, I tremble. You, the great Colonel Joshua Jordan, trembling with fear. There was derision in Zadok's voice. I tremble because of what I've read. About what? Bensky asked. I've studied the Bible for the last two years. I'm no scholar, but I tremble at what it says in 1 Kings 11.1. 1. Bensky's face looked as if he were searching his memory, but he came up blank. Joshua quoted the verse from the Old Testament. Solomon, however, loved many foreign women. How dare you? Zadok cried out. My Prime Minister, Joshua said, disregarding the Chief of Staff, adultery can come in many different forms. Don't you agree? I know you must see that God has warned Israel throughout Scripture, but entering into political treaties and intrigues with foreign powers. Political adultery, when it can cause the nation to depart from God's purposes. Debbie Eliud jumped to her feet. Gentlemen, this meeting is over. Solbensky said nothing. He sat motionless in his high-backed chair glumly staring straight ahead as Joshua, Joel Harmon, and his small entourage tentatively rose to leave. Then the group was briskly escorted from the room. Zadok and Iliad closed the door and quickly returned to their chairs across from the Prime Minister. Zadok led off. Now you see, sir, exactly what we are dealing with. Joshua Jordan is the foreign enemy here. He is the agitator, and our young impressionable member of the Knesset, Joel Harmon, has been taken with Jordan's radical views. You still have a strong coalition in the Knesset behind you. Demi eluded for a while. 
We don't know how long that will hold. The treaty with the UN must be signed immediately. And, Sadak added, Colonel Jordan must also be neutralized before he wins any more converts to his anti colican views. Sadly, he does have a certain influence among some Israelis. But he is a defender of Israel, Pensky said limply. And I, for one, appreciate the RTS technology he designed and for his zeal for our nation. This is so difficult. Bensky put a hand to his forehead and rubbed it slowly. Of course, Mr. Prime Minister, Zedek said in a voice that was soothing, almost musical, like chimes in the wind. We understand. That is why you must allow us, Miss Eliud and myself, to take care of this Colonel Jordan business. You needn't worry about it any more. Yes. Demi Elud added, Joshua Jordan can be taken out of the equation and very quickly. Eliud and Zadok locked glances. Without a word, all three knew what had to be done. Chapter 22 Washington, D.C. When Abigail received the text message, it was a jolt. It was from former Department of Justice Prosecutor Harley Collingwood. His text simply said, Meet me at Jefferson Memorial, and gave the time. So once again, Abigail chartered the family's private jet from the hangar at JFK and flew down to Washington. And once again, Cal went along for the ride. Abigail had been so observed and tr absorbed in trying to dig up further information on the potential threat against Senator Hugh Bright that she had been able for a few hours at least to put her husband's excruciating legal dilemma out of her mind. But not entirely. She couldn't forget that Collingwood's inside information about the activities of the prosecutors in Attorney General Hamburg's Department of Justice office might be her only hope. Collingwood might know how they had managed to get Attorney Ellen Fulson to spin his false story about Joshua's alleged plan to create a takeover of the defense and security apparatus of the United States government. Abigail and Cal had just landed at the private hangar at Reagan International. She was about to step into the limo when she said to Cal, So you'll be all right? He nodded with a smile. Mom, I'm old enough to take care of myself. Don't worry. What are you going to do? I'll fill you in later. I'll be okay, really. She hesitated. Something's going on. Anything you want to share? Mom, get to your meeting. You're going to be late. Ignoring her maternal instincts, Abigail ducked into the back seat. The driver closed the door and hopped behind the wheel. After ten minutes of heavy traffic along the Potomac, Abigail's all phone lit up and it was John Gallagher. When she answered, he gave her the update on his Hubright investigation. Okay, Abby, here's the dope. I've been in contact with the FBI agent, as you know. Right? 
Agent Bowling. We've been talking. I got him to open up. That was no small miracle by the way, and it turns out that shortly before the disappearance of the Hugh Bright campaign worker, this Perry Tedrich guy, he had a visit from someone on Hugh Bright's national campaign staff. And Hugh Bright's assistant campaign manager, woman by the name of Katrina Amid. Abby, you take all the fun out. Right, that's her. You know her? Just met her once in Denver after one of the senator's speeches. Abigail didn't yet elaborate about the sixth sense she had around Katrina. After reflecting a moment, Abigail followed up. But you're sure it was her, Katrina Amid, who visited Perry Tedrich right before he disappeared? Sure, I'm sure. Why? Abigail didn't respond. Gallagher went on. You know, Abby, you never told me why you thought that Hubright might have some kind of mole or dirty operative within his staff. You want to share that with your good buddy, John Gallagher? Not yet, John. Any reason? I don't want my ideas to color your investigation. Wow! Now you're sounding like my old supervisor at the Bureau. <laughs> he always went by the book. Well, it's just that I have such a high regard for your ability, John. I need your untainted impressions. All of this could be just a wild-eyed theory. Maybe I've got you chasing a fantasy. On the other hand, one thing is not fiction. What's that? Hugh Bright's Wichita election guy was murdered and dumped in a shallow grave. Nothing make-believe about that. On his second visit, this is Bethesda Convalescent Center. On his second visit, Cal could see a remarkable change. Former President Cortland was sitting up straight, his eyes bright and clear, and his speech, while still slow, was intelligible and coherent. When Cal arrived, Cortland's wife had told Cal that her husband was having one of his better days. Then she headed down to the cafeteria, leaving Cal and Corlin alone with a nurse nearby. Corlin asked Cal, in a series of strained words, about his plans for the future. Law school, Cal said. Corlin smiled and nodded. <laughs> Following your mother. Sort of. Though she never pressured me, I, I was going into art at first. You know, actually, I had some of my paintings showing in a gallery up in Boston. But things changed. I decided to go in another direction. Happened sometimes, Corlin said, then nodded to the nurse to leave them alone. She smiled and dutifully left that area of the day room. He noticed that Corlin followed her with his eyes, too. Now the only person in sight was a Secret Service agent seated on a chair just outside the room, out of earshot. Corlin immediately opened up. I wanted you here to tell you what secrets Cal didn't know how to respond 
Can I trust you? Cornelin asked. Yes, absolutely. But why me? I trusted your dad. He was right about what he told me in the White House about threatened attack. But my people wouldn't listen. They undercut me. Nuclear attack, New Jersey, never would have happened if they had believed your father. I'm glad his round table tried to help. At least New York was saved. I wish your dad was here for me to tell this to. Corlin stopped, then after thinking something through, he continued, but he isn't. No, Cal said with emotion in his voice that had suddenly arisen and surprised even him. He struggled to say it. I wish he was here, too. So, Corlin said with a smile, I have to trust someone. I'll tell you then. Trust you. Maybe you are like your dad. Cal smiled. It was an accolade he didn't think he'd earned, but he nodded and leaned back in the soft chair in the sunroom to listen. Corland proceeded to explain about his White House physician having health problems himself, and how his personal doctor had to resign. President Corlin had been treated for his condition of transient ismic attack, a syndrome that threatened his ability to continue in his duties if not kept under control. The public hadn't been told about it up to then. When Corlin's own White House physician left, Jessica Tolrude insisted that until a new White House doctor was appointed, Corlin ought to use the vice president's personal physician, Dr. Jack Putner. Up to that point, Corlin pointed out to Cal, his own doctor had prescribed only blood thinners to decrease the risk of blackouts. But Putna gave me something else, Corlin said. And right after that, after a speech in Virginia, I had that terrible attack in the limo. And I almost died. What kind of medicine? Not sure, Corlin said. Then his face took on an intense, twisted grimace. But I think Dr. Putner and Tulroot tried to kill me. Chapter 23 The idea was to understand, elegant in its simplicity, Joshua Jordan was a domestic terrorist. Former federal prosecutor Harley Collingwood spoke matter-of-factly as he stood on the bottom steps of the Jefferson Memorial. The crowd was sparse that day. Even so, he kept his voice low. He continued, I looked over all the evidence we had to support that theory of the case against your husband. I was given the file by the DOJ lawyer supervising the whole case. Not just the charges against Joshua, but those against you and all the members of the round table. That attorney was Assistant Attorney General Dylan Gowers. So I read it all through several times. 
The theory was that when your roundtable group hired those ex-special ops guys to stop the portable nuke from entering New York City, that was a powerful piece of evidence we could use to convince a jury that you were running a private vigilante force bent on usurping the United States government. Sure, you intercepted the truck and you kept it out of New York, but your special ops volunteers paid a dear price when the terrorists detonated it along the New Jersey shore. So did the thousands of people in the nearby town who died in the blast. It was just blind luck that the heavy winds blew the radioactive cloud out to sea and more people didn't die. Abigail interjected, Harley, we tried to warn the federal authorities through multiple avenues about the nuke. Our private intelligence sources told us the bomb was bound for New York, and we told the government that, but they didn't do anything. Sure, we knew you'd probably assert a good Samaritan defense. On the other hand, as I viewed the case, I felt we could overcome that defense, but it required one important piece that was still missing. Abigail put her finger on it. Attorney Alan Fulson. Right. Now, of course, we, we had Fulson in our corner already, but the stuff he gave us in the FBI 302 reports that Joshua was talking about revolution and all that could all be explained away logically. It was clear that Joshua was talking politics and social change and not armed uprising. So I told Assistant Attorney General Gowers, I said, look, you, you need something stronger from Folsom, if that's possible, or you'd better contemplate ditching this case. A week later, he sent me an email. In the attachment was a second statement from Folsom, and what Folsom alleged in this new witness statement was incredible, incredibly powerful. He claimed that Joshua had said it was time for an armed militia to arm wrestle our national defense out of the hands of the Defense Department by force, if necessary, and that he was creating his own private army. But as I looked at Folsom's second statement, I noticed it wasn't an FBI 302. It was a supplemental statement from Folsom, which had been de transcribed directly by Gowers himself during his own interrogation with no other witnesses present. That's when I got suspicious. A couple of joggers appeared in the walkway along the Potomac, heading their way. Collingwood stopped further, stepped further up the stairs toward the Jefferson Memorial, and Abigail followed. So I started digging around. I found that in the intervening week, when the second interrogation took place, and his second statement was obtained by Gowers. Folsom had been threatened with a phony criminal charge of human trafficking by Gowers. Apparently, Folsom, excuse me, I skipped a page, had a girlfriend from Canada 
living with him, who had entered the United States illegally. So Gower is railroaded Folsom with this ridiculous criminal charge, alleging that Folsom was running a business of bringing prostitutes into the country. Folsom got scared, and that did the trick. Abigail scampered up a few more stairs ahead of him till she was standing over Collingwood and stopped him in his tracks. So Folsom was coerced into making up false testimony against Joshua by being threatened with a phony criminal charge himself. Collingwood looked visibly uncomfortable. Look, Folsom's no saint. He just wanted to get close to the round table so he could spill the beans to Tolrud's staff in hopes of currying favor. They took the information and gave it to Hamburg so it could be used in a prosecution. But Folsom ended up getting nothing out of the deal. Ag Abigail shook her head astonished. I knew Tolru's people were corrupt, but had no idea how corrupt. An assistant attorney, General Gowers, he was part of this? He as much as admitted it to me that after Tolru became president, the gloves were off. No limits. Joshua Jordan was to be destroyed. Your roundtable and your media outlet of Mara News has made life a nightmare for Tolrude, with all your investigative reports, starting with her long-standing objections to your husband's RTS system when she was vice president. Then, when President Corland had one of his blackouts and the North Korean ship launched the nukes at New York and the Pentagon utilized the RTS anyway and saved the entire city. Tilrude came out and said that yes, of course, she authorized and tried to take the credit. She even repeated that lie to Congress in the aftermath. Mara News was the only source that ran with that story about Tolrud's false statement and the expose and Mara News ran about Tolrud violating the law by directing A.G. Hamburg to launch politically motivated criminal prosecutions. Your husband, as an example. Anyway, Gowers distinctly told me that the word had come down from the White House through A.G. Hamburg, starting from day one, that a case had to be made against your husband at all costs. Then when you were able to get the case against you and all the members of the Brown Table dismissed, all except Joshua, of course, Tilrud went completely crazy and called Hamburg. She screamed at him to chase Jordan to the ends of the earth, if necessary, to apprehend and convict him. That's a direct quote, by the way. This has become very personal for President Tolrud. The Jefferson Memorial was now empty of visitors, so Abigail and Collingwood strode up the steps and into the circular rotunda. Abigail had visited it a few times when she practiced law in Washington many years before. She gazed up at the huge marble panels inside, 
covered with quotes from Thomas Jefferson, chiseled in stone. Harley, you're an experienced prosecutor. You understand what's going to happen now. I'll take this information and present it to the United States District Court here in Washington, where Josh's case is pending. This is the most shocking example of government misconduct in a criminal case that I've ever heard. This is what I've suspected, but I couldn't prove. Waiting for, praying for, and now it's here at my feet. This could result in Josh's case being dismissed. But I have to ask, what made you come here today to tell me all this? Harley Collingwood tilted his head and nodded toward the inscriptions on the wall in front of him. I was just hired by a great criminal defense firm here in town, Dreger, Proxy, and Lugot. When they told me two days ago, they wanted me not just as an associate, but as a partner. I came over here to the memorial to spend some time mulling it over. Collingwood pointed to a familiar text inscribed in marble and read it aloud word for word. God, who gave us life, gave us liberty. Can the liberties of a nation be secure? when we have removed a conviction that these liberties are the gift of God. Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice can't sleep forever. He turned to Abigail. My conscience wouldn't let me sleep and these words of my hero, Jefferson, kept haunting me. So because of that, you decided to disclose this to me? That, Collingwood said with a half grin. It also the fact that my new law partners can't stand Jessica Torood. They told me that they, I had their blessings to blow the lid off this. Chapter 24 Jaffa Street, Jerusalem Chad Zadok and Demi Eliud, Prime Minister Bensky's top staffers, arrived at the address in Jerusalem. It was a small, nondescript office with a sign outside that read in Hebrew, Traffic Safety Office. When they entered, they identified themselves to a secretary who then showed them to the back office. Seated at a desk, a solid-looking bald man in a black T-shirt and a tan suit instructed them to close the door and sit down. Zadok and Elud were now sitting across from an operations member of Shin Bet, Israel's domestic security service. He called himself Ram, though he never gave his last name. Ram asked them to confirm the reason for the meeting. Zadok did the talking. It's a explained on the phone. Prime Minister Bensky wants this. The official at your agency told me to come here. If you don't mind my saying on internal security matters like this, 
especially where it originates from the Prime Minister's office, usually comes to us from someone in the IDF or in the cabinet, not a chief of staff like yourself. Zadok wasn't flustered. No offense taken. This is highly sensitive. Ram raised an eyebrow, but his face was stone. Everything I do here is highly sensitive. Tell me something I don't know. Zadok straightened his legs and crossed them casually. The Prime Minister wants this action taken immediately. I've already made the necessary contacts with the requesting nation. This transfer can be made very quickly. Rem had a thin file on his desk. He opened it just long enough to give it a quick glance. You have anything personal in all this? No. This is strictly a matter of national security and public safety at the Prime Minister's request. After flipping through a few more pages of the file, Ram looked up. Now you realize that the authorization for this, the legal hook, is that you say this guy is suspected of anarchist connections? You understand that? Zadok smiled, easy and nodded. You swear that the information you gave the intake officer is true and correct under penalties of law. Again, Zadok nodded a little more eagerly. How about you, Mrs. Elliot? You agree with all this information? She nodded yes, but less enthusiastically. Do you have a problem with my executing this order, Miss Elliot? She shook her head no and directed her gaze toward Ram's neck. Look at me when I ask you a question, please. No, Dimi said, looking him in the face. No problem. Very well. Shad Zadok began to stand up. Not so fast. One more thing. Oh? I want you to approach my desk. They followed his directive. He twirled the file on his desk around so that it was open and facing the two of them. There was a photograph in the file. Is this Anna, the anarchist you're referring to? They examined the photo of Joshua Jordan. They nodded. Yes, absolutely, Sadok said. Ram pulled the file back and closed it. Sadok asked, How long before Jordan is captured and turned over to the FBI for extradition back to America for trial? When it comes to this office, there are no back burners. In the city of David section of the old city of Jerusalem, Joshua made his way through the buckets and shovels on the ground and ducked under metal scaffolding. He turned to Pastor Peter Campbell, walking next to him. So I get the feeling that you brought me here for a reason, and it obviously doesn't involve our favorite sporting rivalry on the links. 
Campbell struggled. When I left my church in Manhattan to set up shop here in Jerusalem, uh -huh. it was a serious business. You know the story, Joshua convinced the return of Christ is imminent. Having been the head of the American Prophecy Council of Pastors, I felt led to relocate to Israel and share the gospel right here at the epicenter of prophetic events. But on the less serious side, yes, I did look for a good golf course <laughs> in Jerusalem, but, you know, there aren't any. Up in Caesarea, yes, but that's a really long drive. You and I need to take a day trip up there just to try the course sometime. Maybe I can actually beat you for a change. Joshua smiled, tipped his head, and remarked, You just may do that, my friend. My game hasn't been the same. But he didn't need to finish the sentence. Campbell nodded and said, Right. Your injuries from Iran. On the other hand, I may have lost my golf handicap, but I sure gained something even better in that hellish jail in Tehran. Campbell patted him on the back. Josh, he said, pointing up ahead. That's why I think you're really going to appreciate this. They turned a corner, still underneath the scaffolding. Suddenly, Joshua was looking at a set of stone steps that had been uncovered in an archaeological dig. They led straight up to a point where they disappeared into the side of a hill. I know the guys involved in this excavation. This is incredible. They tell me that during the time of Christ, these very steps led up to a corner of the first century Herodian temple. Okay, what's the rest of the story? These steps led up to the section of the temple where the Jews who wanted to make a sacrifice would purchase an animal. That was the area where the trades were made, the place where the tables of the money changers were located. Joshua felt the shiver of recognition run up his spine, a feeling of awe and suspension of time as if all the world's activity had ceased. I get it. These are the steps. Campbell nodded and pointed to the edges worn down by the feet of countless pilgrims who had made their way to the temple. These are the steps that would have been trod by Jesus as he climbed up to the money changers' tables where Prophet had become king. Up there is where he flipped the tables and declared for all to hear the house of God should not be turned into a den of thieves. Even though Joshua knew the gospel account, it took several minutes to sink in. And finally he spoke. Wow. He shook things up, the Lord Jesus, I mean. Sometimes dramatically. Sometimes a little more quietly, but one thing about the intersection of Jesus Christ with human history, wherever and whenever he shows up, things are never the same again. I can vouch for that. 
Joshua said, still gazing at the steps. I've changed. Hoo-hoo-hoo. Radically. Supernaturally. I'm not the same man since I received Christ. I can vouch for that. Joshua then turned to face Campbell. I caught your television interview, the one with Bart Kingston, about your ministry here. I really do miss Eternity Church back in New York, but what's going on here is epic. I felt the Lord wanted me here. It's, it's almost too much to comprehend. It's getting so close. Peter, I spoke to you earlier about my meeting with Prime Minister Bensky, about the United Nations proposal giving Israel a piece of the territory on top of the Temple Mount and the building of a new Jewish temple. You said you'd give me your candid reaction, so I'm waiting. Campbell gazed at the ancient steps once more and explained, After our Lord comes for his church and raptures us, darkness will fall on this earth. Eventually the evil one will be fully revealed. You know the scripture, it tells us that when that happens, he will enter the temple of the Jews. He will declare himself to be a god, and in so doing, will revile and desecrate that place. But all of that requires one thing to happen right up there. Campbell pointed up the stone steps to the high plateau of the Temple Mount, the rebuilding of the Jewish Temple. And now, from what you've told me, I believe it's about to happen. Oh, how the coming of Jesus Christ for his church must be so very close. And that's it for this time. Tune in next time for Brink of Chaos. Woo-hoo-hoo.